As the official healthcare provider of Minnesota United, Alina Health is focused on keeping our loons in top condition. And with expertise in orthopedics, sports medicine, heart care, and more, Alina has the team to keep your family in the game too. The experts at Alina Health take the time to get to know you as a whole person, helping you achieve wellness for your mind, body, and spirit. It's an altogether better kind of healthcare. Learn more at alinahealth.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another fabulous episode of Sound of the Loons presented by Alina Health. And I guess I said fabulous, but I should sort of just leave that up to those that actually listen and watch it. I just self-promoted that one. So we'll I was just going to say, though, Kendra, I was just going to say when you said that, I would agree that up to this point, they've been fabulous. But we're going to try to make sure I don't lower that bar today. So maybe I think that's a good call. Maybe wait till we get to the opposite side of it and then let people decide if it's fabulous or not. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you usually bring the knowledge and bring the info and bring the energy. So I think we're good, but we do have Diego Pacheco on after this. So excellent. we've had some pretty good um, Academy and MNUFC two guests on this thing. So it's been fun to hear from that side of, of things with Minnesota United this season and kind of dive more into it. Their unique, incredible stories are. So that's been good. So as you heard, it was Sherry Ballard. If you're not viewing this, you're seeing this or hearing this. Um, Sherry Ballard, CEO of Minnesota United. And this is just a good moment. And, you know, we'd love to talk to Adrian too, but, you know, they've kind of got a busy schedule right now. And I know you're busy too, but, you know, they flew right from Portland, I believe to Houston. They've got an yeah, open cup game tomorrow night against an opponent that they just beat at home, which is always tricky the way this open cup regular season schedule has kind of worked out for a lot of teams. So um, we're checking in with Sherry sort of, I don't want to call it a mid season check-in because they feel like we're sort of, what are we, a third of the way in? What are we on match day 15? I think about a third of the way sounds good. Yeah, yeah, about a third of the way. And plus you get Le- Leagues Cup thrown in there. So I'm, I'm not good at math. That's why I do broadcasting. So I try to stay away from the numbers. But how are you? How are you surviving? We just talked about it before coming on, like survive in advance. We just got to, you know, day by day, hour by hour. Like, you know, you are alive and well after the 95th minute bunk group play a phone one goal to, to seal the deal in Portland. How are you doing? Yes, I am alive and well. Uh, it, that boy, that was that was incredibly exciting. It was so good to see. You know, there's been a couple times this season, as you know, where we've sort of been snake bit on the other side of that too. So to get one back um, after a game where I thought the guys were very solid, worked hard on the road. You know, day after learning that you know Robin is out injured, which just could be you know tough setup. Portland, not easy place to play. Uh, thrilled with the outcome. Uh, thrilled with the way it ended. Very happy for Bongi. I, I don't, I'm sure Adrian's not happy that he got the yellow, but I loved Bongi doing the Brandy Chastain with the, with the, the shirt, shirt. Lo- loved every single bit of it. And the fact that they actually wear like a sports bra underneath now, I mean, just right, like, exactly. you know, with the, with the fitness tracker, it sort of just really epitomized it. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. He doesn't miss the next match or anything with that yellow, does he? No, but we are in this yellow card accumulation phase now. Fortunately for him, he's not a guy I don't think that gets a whole ton of yellows. He's not setting any record books there like Diego Chara for uh, Portland in the yellow card accumulation. But I do think that um, a lot of times it's not how you – it's not winning the game, it's how you win the game. And sometimes on the other end, it's not that you lost, it's how you lost the game. And I think that Portland is an incredibly difficult place to play and that knowing on a short week and a quick turnaround off the news of Robin, still missing Ray – you know, these are the kinds of games that if you can gut that out and grind it out. And I, the Portland crowd was going crazy. They were chanting. I mean, the they were in full voice late in that match, trying to kind of urge their team to, you know, get over the hump and get a win. So I, that that's even sweeter. And I, I, you know, I've talked to Michael Boxall about this several times. When you can quiet a crowd like that, is there anything better? I, I don't think so. And you love sports, so you know. Yeah. I think we would all say, uh, including Boxy for sure would say, uh, that's a good way to do it. It does make the ticker, you know, kind of stay at a little bit of an elevated level for, you know, all 94 point, you know, five minutes of it. But 
Yeah, it's fun. It's why we love sports. What can I say? Well, and what did the uh, what did the board say? How much time was there supposed to be added? Because four. that's when you know four, right? And it was in the ninety fifth, or am I wrong on that? Or so ninety four plus whatever. Yeah, no, I don't. I, no, I think it was still like maybe upper ninety three. So it was like right oh, because the yeah. game ended like <laughs> right after. But yeah, let's not spend much time on the. No, but it's the just stoppage, funny because the stoppage time number today. Well, exactly because Minnesota's been on the other end of that, and that's happened yeah. to so many teams this year where it's gone longer than the the board, you know, whatever the board is, is a, is a nice number to put up, but we know right. that's not the final number. So it was nice to see Minnesota on the other end of that play until the final whistle, getting the win. Yeah. And then now you head straight to Houston for that open cup game. And it's tough to be two, you know, the same team twice in a week, whether it's MLS or, or open cup. So I want to ask you too, about this team, you just mentioned it, Robin. And from your vantage point, when you look at the way that guys have continued to step up in the beginning of the season when Ray was missing and it was very much the next man on the mentality, let's focus on who's here, not on who's not here. Adrian has always done a really good job of that being the mentality of the group. Now you have to do that with Robin. And yes, they went through a spell there where they hadn't won a game. I think the first loss came in Chicago and then had, you know, had kind of been snake bit and got the U S open cup wins, of course, but what do you see from this team? You go to training, you know, once or twice a week, you kind of have a pulse on the energy of the staff. What have you seen from this? Cause it's been a lot of adversity on and off the field. Yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, I mean, like the best part of the, of the job is winning. Of course, everybody would say that. Like if you said, what's the best part of the season, the wins, uh, I would say the next, the next thing though. And it's part of what's leading to some of those wins. I love the way the guys have come together this year. Um, you're right. You know, having, Having Ray not here up into I me, mean, he's here now, but it's, you know, it's, it's been a long time coming. And the locker room leadership, I think this year um, with the guys that you would expect, I mean, Boxy is always going to be a locker room leader for us. So we would expect that you'd expect Will Trapp as the captain to be leading. Um, you know, we added Zarek in the off season and we've loved him on the field, but we love him in the locker room too. Um, really great for the culture of the club. Um, so I, I like how the team as a whole is playing, and I do think it's the story of the year. I don't think the story this year is a single player. I think it's a whole bunch of guys on offense and defense, and, and our defense has just been exceptional. And stepping up and winning as a team, supporting each other. Um, you know, and we, and we saw that too. You know, Bongi's goal, we talk about the goal, which was amazing, and his his composure, Mender's composure on that, Kerbin's composure on that. Um, but then he celebrates, you know, by by giving a shout out to, to Robin, you know, giving given Robin's own uh, goal scoring symbol. And, you know, it's, it's just like I like it all. I like that aspect of it. I like what it you know, what it looks and feels like around this team. They're they're an optimistic group of guys who are positive, are proving that they're very mentally tough. Um, and they've dealt with a lot in a short period of time this season. So that that part's been very cool to watch. Oh, and I'm sure you can appreciate too, because as we all know, the MLS salaries came out not that long ago. You know, it's one of yeah. the beauties of the sport is making that public information. And and it's it I'm always a firm believer that the chemistry and the quality and the culture that's set in the team in the locker room can go way farther than any dollar amount. Yes, everybody, of course, you'd love a $10 million number nine or whatever, but there's no guarantee that that player is going to fit into the way the team plays, the culture of the team. I'm heading to Toronto this weekend. They've got two of the top players in the highest salary right. in the league, and they're struggling. So it is so much about the culture and the leadership can override anything else at, at, in the hardest times and the most difficult times. Winning cures all, but at the end of the day, you need that solid culture and you need that quality leadership in the locker room, in the front office, and in the sporting staff. I agree with that. And, you know, we, we've, I mean, the club as a whole is not, I mean, we're not 100 years old, you know, we're six years into it. So there's some of this that, you know, regardless of what, you know, what organization you're in, you sort of build things over time, you build capability over time, you learn from your mistakes, you learn how to do things. So in terms of the direction that we're going and what I would call some of those internal things that you're talking about, you know, how well we collaborate across the club, it's not just sporting, you know, I mean, sporting appropriately gets, you know, the, the view most times because it's at the heart of what we do. Um, but the experience that we give our fans at the, at the stadium on game day uh, and what we do on a daily basis inside the club, you know, in sporting with sporting in the front office, with stadium ops and the collaboration, you know, that we're building across the club is equally important to the outcomes we're trying to get. And it's really important to sustaining those outcomes, you know, over time and through the years. And I, I love the progress we're making there. 
um, in doing that. Uh, there's still, you know, you're never happy enough in these jobs with how people collaborate with each other and what the level of performance is. You always want better and more. Uh, but, you know, you pay attention to trend, too. And I like the direction we're going on a lot of this stuff. And, you know, you're, you're looking- think, you know, go ahead, Kendra. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Finish your thought. No, I was going to say, when you when you look at your point about, you know, what does make for high performance of a group? I do think it's a combination of the individual skills that people bring. Again, whether that's, you know, the front office staff for our sporting staff for our players, you have to be great at what you do individually. And so there's always an element of that. And that's true with players, too, in terms of getting what we think are the, the right kinds of players at the right level of performance for our club. And then making sure that they're playing together and that they're working together because it very often is the together that causes something that on, I mean, we've all seen it a million times in, in sports where you'll see a, a, a roster on paper that looks like a team shouldn't lose a game all season. And they do because the, the chemistry just isn't working and the guys or gals aren't playing together. So I think it's both, you know, it is working on the, the culture and the collaboration and the team environment but it's also constantly looking at the individual players and making sure we believe that we've got, you know, the right combination of guys too to be able to get the outcomes that we want. And, you know, we're it's it's no secret we're right we're coming right off a win and we're thrilled with that and like what we're seeing. But we're also on balance for the year, not scoring enough goals yet, and we know that. And it, it ends up putting an awful lot of pressure on the defense. Um, and so we've got to keep working to solve that with the guys we have. Um, and then we're constantly looking to, you know, in the places where we're not happy with the outcome we're getting, is there a way for us to get better? So, you know, we're, we're evaluating that too. I just love that you said gals, because I grew up with that word <laughs> along with supper, which my am husband I, says is I like not a real say, thing. It's okay to say gals, isn't it? I love it. I'm just okay, saying, yeah. saying like, nobody uses that word. Like I grew up with that word. Like that was my grandparents, my parents, my family. And like, along with supper, which my husband like, literally like, that's not a real thing. I'm like, well, yes, supper is a it's, thing. I'm exactly. You right now, Thank you. Supper Thank you. is a thing. Yes. And pop is a thing too. Yeah. Supper well, that thing, I make sure every, every press box and every place I've gone to this season, when I ask for a pop, they look at me and I'm like, I'm not changing it. I'm going to keep sure. saying pop until you understand what I mean. You know, I'm not, exactly. I'm not changing to soda. I'm not doing it. Good job. Yeah. Stay um, I, yeah. You got to stay true to your roots, right? We all know that's like one of the basics in life. Um, so what do you, when you look at this group and moving forward and you have a tough job because you're dealing with both sides of the spectrum, you're talking about bringing people together. You're talking about getting people on the same page, having communication, but it's so different in sports maybe than even some other industries is that there's, and, and Minnesota has a bigger challenge too, and, or a challenge, I should say, with the different locations and trying to make sure that everybody is respectful of everybody else's role, understanding everybody's role and how you bring the best out of everybody to make this work for everybody. Home wins help you. You got one last week against Houston. You've had an open cup, massive win against Philadelphia Union, which is also hard on the ticker. Oh my but- gosh. Talking about hard on the ticker. <laughs> Literally when that game was over, I sent Bill a text and I said, Bill, I will not be in tomorrow. I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like me neither right like, well oh, i talked to dj dj did the podcast the next day i'm like wow thanks for coming in. he's like yeah to be honest by the end he's like i just wanted to go home like he was like i'm just you know i'm done like the minutes and the miles that those guys have put yeah, on with their schedule yeah. but how how do you how does your side of the business that side of the business navigate what the sporting side is doing and i get it it's all a team but it sure makes it a lot easier on everybody in corporate partnerships the ticket sales and fan engagement and people that want to be on the front lawn we have a, an insane environment you guys do at allianz field with minnesota united the fan base is incredible but wins help so how how does that how does that energy you know evolve Well, what I can confirm uh, that you already know, and so does everybody who spent their time in sports know, but I can confirm from my own experience. Now, Mondays after a win on the weekend, everybody is just a little bit more, you know, amenable to working together. So (laughs) Mondays after a win, there there's the, the vibe is better and it's better everywhere in the club. You know, it's better with the players. It's better with me. You know, it's better, with, <laughs> it's better with Michael on our finance team. That's just true because it, you know, it, it's, it, we're no different than our fans in that way. We're, you know, it matters. You know, I want to win every single game. I want to win every preseason game. I want to win every friendly. I want, and I want to win by a lot. 
I mean, that, that's just you know, it's sports. And so that's that is universally true. I'm sure that's the same way in every club. It's definitely true here. Um, and then on the days when you don't get the win, yeah, everybody's a little bit crabbier. And, it, and I'm, I'm glad about that, too, because it matters. If there was an, a level of ambivalence about it, you know, if our fans were, well, it doesn't really matter. They tried hard. No, I want our fans to hold us accountable for, for winning on and off the field. And the same thing's true inside the club, you know. I think what you, you know, what I try to do in the job, and I think probably what most leaders try to do, is just make sure that while we're staying very competitive around what we're trying to do, competitive in our results on the field, you know, competitive in terms of the fan experience that we give people, we pride ourselves in being the absolute best sporting event in town and the best value for money and being respectful. And we want to compete around that. But you also have to just make sure that when you're not getting the outcomes you want, people don't turn on each other. And, you know, that's that's typically when it happens. People start turning on each other when they're frustrated. And so I think the job of leadership is is to make sure that we stay together. We stay a collective team. We push to make each other better in the places we need to. But we remember, you know, the enemy is outside the outside the stadium. It's 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 not here, you know. So, you know, you do the best you can with it. But it's it's a competitive group. I will say that. Yeah, you, you. it is more concerning when somebody doesn't look like they care, when the result doesn't go their way, or when a deal doesn't get done, or when yep. something, you know, a, a fan experience, whatever it might be. And like, and, and that's the, I remember, you know, I, being inside that stadium and hearing the buzz and the communication and people pacing around before anybody else was in the building yet. Doors weren't, weren't open, but people trying to get organized and whether it's operations and otherwise, everybody working on the same page to create the best thing. And you could tell that people were disappointed or frustrated when something wasn't done the right way. So you have to kind of find that balance because you want that. You want people right. to be frustrated and disappointed and and raise this level. People shouldn't lower their expectations for themselves and others. But right. at the same time, how do you then move forward? And the same is true when the results are on or off the field or whether the, you know, whether it's going on in the front office or the sporting or whatever it might be, you want everybody to raise the level, but it's like, how do you move on when it's not going great? Yeah. And I think we've talked about that before when you were, you know, when you were here, when you were still with us full time, <laughs> which I'm still sort of bitter about, honestly, <laughs> but we've, we've talked about that just in the dailiness of the jobs, you know, like, yeah, I want people who are a member of the team at the club, whether it's on the field, front office, ops, anywhere, I want people to aspire for us to be better in all aspects of what we do. And I want them to take the initiative in making us better. And, we, you know, I don't always love that when you or somebody else is getting on me because we should be better in an area. I don't love it, but I also understand, I, I hate the alternative, which is that we're all sort of apathetic and it doesn't really matter one way or the other. It does matter. And it matters that people are contributing and helping to make the club better, but doing it in a productive way. What's been the best part of your job now? Cause I feel like every time we've talked to you, you've been, you know, three months in six months in a year in year, whatever. This like, is my third partial season at this point. If you can even believe it. I know. It. Can you it's believe it? So I mean, I don't know. Has time flied or, you know, usually time yeah. flies when you're having fun and I know yeah. you've got all sorts of things going on. And, and we've had this conversation right from the get go about wanting to say yes to more things with family and spending time and doing things and whatever, but what's been the best part of this job so far? And then maybe what's been the most surprising or most challenging in your role? The best part of the job is the people. Um, it, it, it is. I mean, like across the board, it's the people. Um, there are a lot of really great quality people when I got here. Um, and we've added, you know, we've added some too, but I really enjoy it. I mean, I enjoy the people I work with. I like the different perspectives people have. Um, you know, we laugh a fair amount. We uh, are super competitive. As I, as I mentioned before, I'm learning things, which is great and important for me. I've probably learned more I mean, I, I said when I came into the job that I knew I had a lot to learn about the community. And I thought this role, um, because of the nature of community in soccer and for sure with Minnesota United, community is such a big part of what we do. Um, I knew it would put me in a position where I was going to have to learn a lot about the community. Um, and I am and I have. It's been good for me. And it's also really meaningful to spend so much of our, our time and our time with our partners you know, understanding what the needs are in the community and then trying to work alongside people who are are basically spending their whole lives trying to make the community better. So that aspect, both inside the club, the people um, and outside in the community have been, that's our fans, our season ticket members. That's, 
I love every single bit of that. Even like I said, when it's not perfect, you know, and, and people are upset. I like all of that. Uh, I love the sport. I mean, I, I, I love the watching the games, the, are we going to win? Are we losing? I mean, like the whole aspect of sports and being able to do that full time. I, I feel enormously blessed. I love that. I love the scale of the club. Um, you know, I, I, I know all the people that work here. They know me. I know a lot of our season ticket members. Um, so that part is very cool. Um, I would say the hardest part of the job is, um, is just how much you do or don't control in terms of the outcomes, you know? I mean, that's always true. You, you're you telling know, me he hasn't recruited you to be the number nine yet. <laughs> no, is that not what you're yet. saying? I don't think that's going to happen uh, <laughs> any, any, any time soon. But, you know, I mean, in any job, you sort of, I, I think, are, are kind of fooling yourself as a leader if you think you have control over everything. And the more you try to exert it directly, the less you actually have in certain ways. Um, but there is also a, a nature to sports, you know, that you can do it. We've seen it, you know, you can do everything right up until that one second where you don't. And, you know, it's all for not. And there goes the three points, you know. So I think that aspect of just how much of it is it's hard to it's hard to win a cup in any sport, including this one. So that that part's not surprising, but it is what keeps us coming back to try to solve it and to to make it work. I would say that that part of it is probably the, of course, it's the most challenging, but it's also the thing that also makes it super interesting to try to do it because it's not easy. I want to know too, though, because, you know, back to that whole conversation that we had before you were even announced about, you know, saying yes to more things. I, I do, I am, I've witnessed firsthand the energy of your crew sitting right in front of the broadcast booth. Being yeah. in the suite, you know, for the all-star game or being a part of the February 2nd men's national team game. And and what has that been like for you to be able to welcome your friends and family yeah. into your workplace at Allianz Field and include them in this journey? I Thank you for asking that question. Um, because I think, you I mean, people, people who know me know that, that there's usually... I mean, we I, I go through my tickets. I go through Bill's tickets. I go through... <laughs> My, the t- the ticket sales team loves me. I'm buying game day tickets. <laughs> I mean, I'm I am very fortunate in that our 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 close group of friends, um, our son Richard who lives here, um, and our daughter Brittany when she's in town, and our grandkids, all love it. They love it, and they all they want to come to every single game. Um, and so it's that part makes it definitely even even more meaningful because I don't feel like on game day. I don't have to make a trade off on game day between whether I'm going to spend, you know, now they're mostly on Saturdays, you know, so am I going to spend, you know, Saturday night with our family or our friends, you know, or am I going to go to work because of the nature of what we do here um, and the fact that it, our family loves sports and they love soccer and they love Minnesota United. And so do our friends, they come to all the games. And so that part is very cool to be able to experience it not just with the people and the players and Adrian and the coaches and the the, the club, because I love experiencing all this with them, but to have friends and family be able to do that is is very cool. So I I, I appreciate you actually uh, raising that and shouting out to them because it's a, you know, I mean, I, I love it and I'm coming to the club, but for them, you know, they, they could do something else on their Saturdays if they wanted to, and they don't, you know, and you, you're right there. <laughs> They, 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 a group of them sits in front of the broadcast <laughs> yes, booth. Yes. And so, yes, you, you see their, you yeah. see their enthusiasm during the game. So yeah, yeah, that part's very cool. I feel very, I feel very blessed about that. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, being able to witness that the last couple of seasons, it's like, and, and my new phrase, I feel like in life is like, what fills your cup, Yeah, you know, and like seeing you pop in, you have so many responsibilities on a game day, but you being able to pop in and sit with them for a bit. And, you know, like check in and then you have to pop out and do something and go down to the field at halftime or whatever it is. But seeing, I mean, to me, there's nothing more than seeing other people experience joy and happiness. It like brings you joy and happiness. And that that group and that crew that you have is just, it's fun to watch. I love it. And um, I I can appreciate that because when I, when, when I was doing home games, having Addie and Bobby, there's literally nothing better than them sitting right in front and knowing that that's the way I can interact with them, even though I'm working and they love soccer and they can be there at the same time. There's nothing better. Plus watching Eddie, watch you do your job too. <laughs> you no, know, but it's cool though. Cause there's a, there's a real, you know, there's a real sense of pride about, 
you know, like this is what my mom does and being able to, being able to see, you know, what you're doing for a living is, is very cool. And I would say too, you know, the, the Apple, um, you know, the Apple subscription, the Apple platform and the Apple deal this year um, has also made that easier for, and, and possible for the rest of my family who doesn't live here. You know, they live out of state to, you know, they're watching all the games and, you know, they're, they're looking at the pro, the player profiles and the club stories in the Apple room. And they have them, you know, they, they hear me talk about the people, but they now have a better sense of, Oh, this, this is who that person is and this is what they do. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it is the, it's, it's the mission of the club, you know, to promote soccer, but uh, to, to use soccer to inspire and unite the community. And there's, there's really no better shrine to that. I don't think than what happens, you know, at Allianz field, on game day because it's it's entirely about that and it's true for me and it's true for you and it's you know true for twenty thousand other people i think the players would say like adrian's wife jane is there and she sits in the same you know sits out there with the crowd and her family and the players have their families here so i think everybody would sort of say it you know we're we're at work on that day but the people we love get to experience it with us too which is a that's a pretty cool part of it yeah, that's a great part of it. And I think that that is really true to this sport. And, and you know, I mean, I know other sports have their connections to families and to friends and, and to the fan, you know, the supporters and whatnot. But I feel like and maybe we're biased because we see it um, every day and we, we see the interaction. But it is pretty something, you know, something pretty special. But I want to talk a little bit before we wrap up just about, you know, speaking of sort of family and friends, I think, you know, when there was conversations and when Emmanuel Reynoso did not return to Minnesota United in the beginning of the season, it's like a family member. It's a friend. It's a person that you're, you know, you're not just talking about him from a soccer player perspective. You're right. talking from a human being standpoint. And that's what we have to remember about all athletes. You know, a lot of times with Twitter and other things and they're on the field and there's public eye, like at the end of the day, people have lives, they have families, they have things going on. And at the end of the day, that's where you care about them first and foremost is just making sure that they're okay. And then how, you know, how do we get him to return to Minnesota United to contribute to the team on the soccer field, but most importantly, that he's okay. Now that he's returned and he's come back and maybe, you know, in some people's eyes, it took longer than they thought it should, or, but we all don't know the details and talking to Zarek Valentine last week. I mean, he was very honest. It was right after Ray, I think had addressed the team maybe the day before had finally communicated with them because it was mental health awareness podcast. Yeah, and he said yep. it was, that was such an important part for him to speak to us, for him to hear his feelings, his emotions, to hear it from him directly for guys to maybe have some, um, you know, not closure, but to find a way to turn the page and move on. Because even the way the players were feeling, it's not un unanimous across the board, how right. they were all reacting to Ray being there or not being there. So how has that gone? How is it? How has this sort of roller coaster of a ride been? And then what does it look like going forward? I know if you haven't seen it yet, um, if you're listening to the pod, the the taped statement that Amanda Reynoso did to the fans as well, which is the first time probably most people saw him from a fan standpoint. So right. how do you feel like that's gone and and where's where is he at and how is everybody doing with it? Yeah, I mean it's that it's tough. And it's tough for the reasons that you said, because on one hand, first and foremost, he, he's a human being. And he's got, you know, he's got a daughter, he's got a family, he's got things going on in his life that are beyond, you know, the sport of soccer. And I want to, and we want to respect that and honor these guys as people first. So there's that element where, and I, I'm on the record as having said this, I must've said it a hundred times when I got asked, I, I and we are first and foremost concerned about him as a person and want to make sure he's in a good position to have the support around him that he needs to be the best version of himself. On the other side of that, he's also accountable to people. You know, he's accountable and was accountable to his teammates and to the fans and to the club. Um, and there were things in how he navigated that, that I said at the time, and he knows, I wish he would have done differently. And I think he should have done differently. And, you know, that's, that's what it is now that he's back and he's addressed his teammates, it's going to be up to him in terms of, what he does day in and day out in his actions, not in his words, although I think addressing the team to your point was a really important first step. But like any of us, over time, it's not about what we say. It's about what we do. And people will decide what they think of us based on our track record of our behavior, not just our words. And so he's going to have to do the things necessary to win himself back with his teammates. And importantly, his behavior is going to have to align with it. And that's going to be 
entirely up to him. What I what I re- and I go back to a little bit to what I said at the beginning here on, on an answer to a different question you asked. But what I really like and appreciate is I like and appreciate the rest of the guys stepping up and defining how this team is going to be and who this team is going to be. And I don't think now that Ray is back that they all now become shrinking violets and, you know, it's Ray's team. I don't think that's the case at all. These guys are, they're, they're mentally tough. They've played together well. They care about each other. Well, the cult, the culture in the locker room is very strong. And my best hope would be that Ray is the best version of himself and he makes us better but he makes us better what with all the other guys still playing at a high level and them being great too. And I think we've got the leadership to cause that to happen. Um, but that's like I said, this is going to at this point now be about Ray doing the things that he has said he will do. Um, and the rest of the guys continuing to play well together, um, you know, to be as good as we can possibly be. And, you know, hopefully Ray makes us better. And I've always said, I, I truly believe that soccer is the ultimate team sport. 100%. Because there is no other game out there. And I know there are other sports with 11 guys on the field when you talk about football and whatnot. But this is like next level where it's this free-flowing, free-thinking, creativity, reading the game, solving problems in real time. And I think that that lends itself to this group. And what Zarek said last week, he said, this is a group that has shown so much resiliency, not just about whether Emmanuel Reynoso was there or not, just in general, when you're dealing with different things, injuries, navigating off-field situations, on-field situations, guys stepping up, injuries. This is a group that can navigate that, and they have the talent, but they have the leadership, and they have the the belief in each other and the culture that can get that job done. And then at the end of the day, it's just about doing it on the field and showing that consistency, which – a good majority of this roster understands and can appreciate because they've been around long enough and they know what winning feels like. And they know that if you want to be great, you got to find a way to do it consistently. And for you guys, there is no rest for the weary. You got Tuesday night open cup game at Houston, not an easy place to play. No, and, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you, but it's not going to be Detroit city FC though. <laughs> Nothing's going to top that. I was at that game. I mean, you, you I know I saw you know, a picture I, of you. Know, I grew up in Michigan. Yes. Yeah. And, oh my God. That was, that was that's that was a top that was a top ten for me. It was that I mean we didn't start out playing that well obviously, yeah. uh, but it, it ended. The atmosphere was incredible. You know I mean it's an it's an old school stadium in Hamtramck. The trains are going by, you know the it's the crowd's the crazy. The ball goes out the end of the the field and you know a kid one of the kids' jobs is to retrieve it from the train tracks. It's just <laughs> I mean it was just it was just perfect perfect you know, just sport in the community. So I have to say that one, uh, I'm, I'm very glad we won. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was, it was awesome to be uh, in that environment and just like way back to the roots of the game. Uh, it was, that was very cool. That's the awesomeness of the U S open cup. It truly is. When you talk about the Lamar hunt U S open cup and how long it's been around, I mean, a hundred years and like playing the lower, the quote, lower division teams who have something to prove and they're trying to make their mark and they want to keep knocking off these MLS teams that come in kind of high and mighty. I mean, that is why you play the game. And that's what we just talked about. I mean, their supporters had, I mean, it's like their, their supporters were awesome. You know, they, they had, they had some salty stuff there that probably maybe a little (laughs) bit beeped out on the Apple broadcast, but it it was absolutely awesome. So, uh, but yeah, we're, they do their research. Oh, yeah. They do their good. research on very players good. and things. I mean, these these I fans totally can give you can be intense in what they dig up. So you better no. watch out. <laughs> what they've what they're building there, the the community support in Detroit and uh their their fans were amazing. So it was that was a terrific experience. Awesome. Terrific. Yeah. Well, I appreciate right. you the guys the time have today. been uh, the guys are like the getting close to the million miler clubs uh, <laughs> these days. It's it's a lot of games in a row and uh, you know, they've been holding up great in it. And, you know, I, I would say on our last topic, maybe just one other thing. I think if anything good can come out of Ray not being here at the beginning of the season, it, it was really good to see other guys on the team uh, get noticed, get stories told about them, um, you know, because more often than not, and this is just sort of how this thing goes, that, you know, people are focused on whoever the quote unquote star player is and guys who are contributing in massive ways to a team you know, often aren't really at the forefront of the story. Um, And so the forefront of the story became about all of these individual guys and personalities who are doing incredible things together. And to see them um, appropriately be on center stage 
that that was probably the best thing that could come out of it. And, you know, I, I, I personally want to see it continue. I want to see, you know, all of the guys getting the recognition that they deserve and not having the the story be just about one person. So that's been, um, it, it was good to see. It was good to see some of the guys who have been given it for a very, very long time um, be into the forefront of the story of the club. That's, that was a, that was a, that was a blessing. I agree. It's one of those, you know, a silver lining, a blessing in disguise, whatever it might be that came out of the situation and look forward to seeing the game on Tuesday night. I don't even know when this podcast, you know, grace is magical, but I'm not sure how fast it'll get turned around. She's got a lot of things on her plate, but. And then you're with us. You're not here. You don't have the real salt Lake game, right? But are you with us on June 3rd? I am June 3rd, Toronto, Minnesota United. That is uh, my next Minnesota. I can't wait. I've trust me. I mean, I, I, that was, that one's on the calendar firmly. It gives me, Perfect. you know, a couple of weeks to just kind of gear up for that and, uh, and, and get back home and be well, at I home think, I field. think Bobby and Addie are going to be in that aforementioned group of people that, yeah. you're yes. so speaking of salty language, I'll try to tell, <laughs> I'll try to tell my friends and family to keep the saltiness down. Cause we got a, we got a minor in the house. Hey, you know what? If she doesn't know, she doesn't know. <laughs> like one day she's like, mom, that song has a bad word. I go, what did they say? She's like, hate. I'm like, <laughs> Yes, that is a bad word. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, she doesn't know any other four letter words that are bad. So you're, you're, you're good. She, doesn't, okay, know, right she doesn't know. And that's a great group to be around. So appreciate it. Thanks, Sherry. Appreciate the time. I know you're insanely busy. I got Diego Pacheco coming up in the next segment to tout okay. some knowledge. And, the quality and- of the podcast <laughs> is getting ready to jump up right now. He's having a very good year. So I'm glad you're talking to him. He is awesome. And speaking of leaders, we got one. We got one of Diego Pacheco with the twos. 100%. Summer break is meant to be fun, and what is more fun than playing the beautiful game? This summer, Minnesota United is taking the game to the people with a series of youth camps. Boys and girls between the ages of 7 and 16 all are welcome to attend, regardless of your skill level. MNUFC's academy coaches will be spreading the fun across the region all summer long, including stops in Duluth, Blaine, and even Fargo. Visit the camps and combine section of MNUFC.com to find the camp that works best for you. Again, that is the camps and combine section of MNUFC.com to find the camp that works best for you. Welcome back, everybody. Segment number two of Sound of the Loons this week. We've got another crazy busy week. We just wrapped up with Minnesota United CEO Sherry Ballard, who was persistent in the fact that our next guest is going to raise the level of the podcast after she stepped off. Now we have the goal-scoring phenom, incredible leader, Diego Pacheco, who is currently with Minnesota United 2, the 2Zs, MNUFC 2, however we want to say it. But um, the next uh, the next true quality guests on this podcast, because I can't tell you, Diego, you know, first and foremost, thanks for joining me. Cause I know you have an insane schedule. You probably, we just were talking about it, stepped off the training pitch. Um, I know no rest for the weary and your guys' schedule either. It's right up there with Minnesota United's and the craziness, but thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Kendra. Well, I do agree with Sherry um, and not that I don't love Sherry as a guest, but I do think being able to talk to you and hear your story and kind of tell your story and talk about what it is that makes you tick and how you've become the person and the player that you are is always super insightful. I've gotten to do it with a lot of the twos and the Academy guys this year, and it's been a lot of fun on these podcasts. So I just want to get, you know, give people a little bit of a, a background on you and growing up in Portugal, your life there, what that was like for you, your love for soccer, and how that sort of manifested itself at a young age. Um, yeah, so growing up in Portugal, I feel like the main sport is definitely like soccer, football, as we call it there. And uh, growing up, like I feel like at the age of four, I started kicking the ball everywhere. Uh, at the age of six, I started playing futsal indoor. And by the age of eight, I started playing football. And yeah, it was always my love. I would always be kicking the ball every day in school, between classes, at the end of school, go to training. I would do swimming as well, just to stay fit. And um, yeah, it was always my passion, just every day kicking the ball around. Uh, I play from the age of eight to the age of 10 in my local club, Odi Velish, 
Uh, it was really close from where I live. And um, it was amazing to just being able to play with friends that I grew up with. And at the age of 10, my dad got a call from Benfica. And uh, like I said, it was one of the best days in my life. Um, I had a really good season that year and it was amazing. They recognized it and they called my dad and they said they wanted to see me. And after that, a few days later, Sporting also called my dad. But since my dad gave them the word to Benfica first, we said, listen, you're going to Benfica. And yeah, I went there after a few days, I signed. Uh, and it was amazing to just like represent the biggest, the biggest club in Portugal. You know, it was always and like, what age, wait, is this age 10? So yeah, that was from age 10 to 14, 15 that I, so, I played for Benfica. Yeah. So when you say you went there and signed, I mean, yeah. like, I, you know, I'm just even thinking about my daughter's handwriting at nine. So when you say you sign <laughs> at 10, you know, was, how, how does that, how does that, what, so what is that like that moment? It's not like, it's not like a real contract at that age is, but yeah, the signature was, <laughs> I can't even remember, <laughs> but it was probably so bad, but, um, uh, yeah, like I said, it was just very exciting to be training, playing with the best players in the country and being coached by the best coaches in the country. And uh, every day you would learn new stuff, play with like amazing players that like are at the top of like the world right now. So, yeah, I'm very thankful and I definitely learned a lot during that time of my career. And yeah, after that, I moved to Bolognese, also a first a first division team played there until I was 18 and at the age, age of 18 on my last season before the senior year um we we finished in second so sporting got the first place but uh it was a really good season and then the next year I moved to a third division club I was trying to like play for a first or second division uh team at the time couldn't make it so I started with a third division team and uh, I was kind of stuck, you know, playing with an um, older group. Uh, there was guys I remember like 35, 38, you know, they like, they have a lot of experience and you learn a lot. You definitely learn a lot with those guys just like on and off the field. And um, that's when like the opportunity to come to the, the U.S. came from uh, a coach that used to coach me in Befica. And he reached out to me and he was like, listen, Diogo, um, I have an offer to you. Uh, you could come to the U.S., uh, get a degree and play soccer here. And maybe in like one, two years, you can make it to the pros in MLS. And um, at the time, I was like, oh, I don't know, U.S., you know, because uh, growing up in Europe, we just like have no idea what's happening here in terms of soccer, really. And uh, everything, honestly, like life. Uh, I didn't know anything about like universities, anything. So that's where Jean Moutinho uh, mm -hmm. came in clutch. My friend from Akron, he's now in Spezia in Italy. And um, that's when I talked to him and I was like, listen, like I need to talk to you a little bit about the US and how, how does everything work? And uh, he literally started the conversation with me like this. Listen, if you want to go pro, you got to go to Akron. And <laughs> yeah, you're like, so where's I like, Akron? I know. <laughs> and the first thing he said, yeah, it snows a lot. So that's <laughs> going to be tough. But uh, trust me, like the coaches and if you want to go pro and like uh, train at the highest level and play at the highest level, you got to come here. So, yeah, he started he started to give me the contacts of the coaches. I started talking to them every day. They helped me a lot with like the process, obviously, like getting visas and all that. And um, the assistant coach, Jerry Coppinger, he, helped, he actually traveled to Portugal before that season, just so he could like meet, meet, meet me in person. And um, yeah, he was like my dad at the time. He was really helpful with my parents, uh, everything. And yeah, I'm very thankful I got the chance to play for, for Akron. It was like amazing. It was tough to stay there for four years, that's for sure, uh, just because of the weather and there was not a lot a lot to do, but the, the people there, the coaches, the school, that helped a lot throughout the, those four years. So when you were with um, Benfica, when you, when you were, were you staying not at home? Were you living at home? Were you, so then when you went to Akron, you know, and you're leaving home, 
was that like a totally new experience or when you're with your club in Portugal, mm -hmm. what is the setup there? Are you staying gotcha. at home? Or are you staying with the club? So I actually, I was lucky I got to stay at home because Benfica okay. is really close by me. Um, the training facility was just like across the river. So we would actually go by boat. It would be like a 30 minute boat drive, <laughs> boat ride. So it was fun to just go by boat with the other, with the other guys. Uh, but yeah, I was lucky I got to stay home with my family, always helping me, supporting me. Uh, Blue Nash, I, I also got to stay home. So the big move was definitely when I, I went to Akron. That was like the big change. But uh, I wouldn't do it if uh, I, I didn't feel like I was ready. And it was tough at the beginning, you know, like uh, missing my family a lot. And uh, just like being home, totally different. But um, yeah, I'm happy I did it. When you arrived, and I know, you know, the story that was just written by you on Minnesota United's um, website was talking about you, you finally make the move, you make the big jump, you're leaving your family, you're leaning on people, you arrive at Akron and you get the word that your medical test came back, which, I mean, what was that moment like? And I mean, how were, were your parents <laughs> freaking out or were they like, Sort they of were... talking about it. I mean, walk us through that moment when you when you like finally get over here and then you're like, oh, you need to come back because your medical showed that you have cancer. What was right. that like? You so... can smile about it now, but at the moment it had to have been like. <laughs> yeah, it was no fun. It was no fun. So what happened was uh, my parents and I, we decided to do all the exams we could before moving to the U.S. just to make sure everything was OK. And uh, so I did those exams like a week before. And I actually ended up just getting the results when I was already in Akron. So I, I thought everything was okay. And that's when I got the call from my dad saying, yeah, like uh, the exams you did on, on your throat, the doctor found out like you have a cancer and uh, it was actually malignant. And um, by the time I think it was the size of like a grape. So it was, I don't know how bad it was, but at the time, um, I didn't really care. I don't know how in my head I was just like, all right, like I'm going to uh, play this season at the end of the season. I can I can go back home and just like, we'll fix this. But uh, that's when my dad said, no, you're not understanding. You got to come right now. Like we'll buy you a flight tomorrow because uh, this needs to be done now. And uh, that's when I started crying. Uh, but before that, I was just like, I didn't even realize how bad it was, but um, yeah, I guess it's one of those things you can't really, you have to like get it done right away. Well, and then even, you know, talking a little bit about that though, because sometimes naivety or ignorance can be bliss, right? I mean, because you can just, you know, at that moment you're thinking I'll take care of it at, at the end of the season. But even right. once you go back and you have surgery and people are expecting you to stay there, be in the hospital for a while, stay home for a long time, and sometimes when you just have like your mindset a certain way that just take care of it, move on, turn the mm -hmm. page, do what I need to do. I mean, that's basically what you did there. You returned to Akron in a matter of what, a, a few days. weeks, a month. Yeah, days, yeah, think, yeah, exactly. And then you step on the pitch, you score a hat trick. You know, I mean, <laughs> those are how has that mentality carried you through through your college career? then into MLS, then into, you know, with Minnesota United, MNUFC 2. How has that same mentality carried you throughout your career, throughout your life, and now in the role you're in with the twos? Yeah, I feel like uh, growing up, uh, it comes a lot of my dad just never giving up and uh, work hard always, no matter what, you know, focus on the things you can control in life. Because um, I feel like those are the type of things that – there's always bad things that are going to happen to you throughout your life, your career. And I feel like your success comes in how good and tough you can deal with those situations. And that's what I always try to do throughout my career. Just like be ready for those situations. And whenever they happen, just try to do everything I can to stay on top of my, of my game and everything like mentally, physically, and I remember uh, when I had the surgery, I had to stay like two days uh, in the hospital. And as soon as I got as I got back home, I was already doing something, you know. <laughs> uh, I remember my neck was really sore, just like talking and moving around. 
So I would be like doing bike or like some core workout, just like anything that I could do to move the body and stay in shape. And um, I feel like it's whenever you have in your mindset, okay, I can do this and you stick with that mindset, you never give up. Uh, that's what really makes the difference. And yeah, I feel like throughout my career, um, that's what's been carrying me through the way I, I look at those obstacles and I deal with them because I know they're going to happen. You know, there's going to be obstacles everywhere. Um, and what I try to do is just like be ready to face those obstacles all the time. And then you wrap up at Akron and you find your way to Minnesota United, a slightly colder climate. Yeah, even, even colder. Than even yeah, Akron. Even colder, yeah. You really were packing your park at this point. But last year, and then you see too, was a new team. How did you take on that leadership role? And I know Cameron Knowles, the head coach, has talked about that so many times, the importance of the leadership from last season. And mm -hmm. then now how the leaders have even grown into year number two, because everybody was new to that that team last year, right. the training staff, the coaching staff, the, the film guys, you know, you name it, everybody was new. So how had, how did you take that same mentality into that role? How did you take it upon yourself to be a leader? And you're not just a leader, you're scoring goals. I mean, you have six goals in eight games, but you know, you're contributing on the field, but how did you kind of embrace that role? And what was your mentality with this group at last year in 2022? And then now into 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, like you said, uh, being the first year, I think, um, it was like an introduction year to kind of everyone meeting uh, the entire team and uh, just kind of like get used to relationships within the team. So, yeah, we had a good group, but um, you can tell the chemistry was not as good as this year, obviously, because it was the first year. So, yeah, last year I, I told myself uh, I was going to commit to like be a leader for this team and uh, try to help everyone this year. And I'm really trying to do that, do that every day in training by just giving my best, uh, being an example to everyone, uh, make everyone like feel good uh, even after like something bad happens or if something off the field happens, I, I will always try to like communicate. I feel like communication is a big part of uh, being a leader. And uh, I've been trying to improve um, on that. Even like English not being my first language, you know, I always try to, because I feel like that's a big part of the game. Uh, obviously, like we have a very good, talented group. Uh, everyone can tell that. But uh, communication and the way um, the, rela the relationships work inside the team, I feel like, that's the game changer to like win championships. And uh, that's what I'm trying to work uh, on here. And um, I feel like it's very important every day you come in, just try to be ready to help everyone, uh, players communicate with coaches. If there's something like they want to pass to the players. And um, yeah, I feel like it's also contagious, you know, once everyone starts seeing like, yeah, the group, the level has been better in training. Uh, I feel like everyone starts kind of like embracing that mentality. And yeah, things just go better from there. And lastly, I just want to know, what is, ha has your family been here? Have they been able to be a part of it? Have they been able to watch? Have they, I'm sure they're coming in like July. You're not going to come in February, but <laughs> How much have you been able to have your family a part of your soccer life here in the United States, whether at Akron or whether with Minnesota, mm -hmm. having made the move and having them be so, so influential in your young years? Right. Uh, in Akron, my parents went there twice. They got to go there twice. And uh, one of the times was like close after the surgery on my birthday, September. So that was amazing. That was pretty nice. And um uh, then for my graduation, my dad and my my granddad, they were both there. And in Minnesota was my mom and my brother last year. So that was pretty cool. Uh, the weather was nice. They got to see the city, <laughs> walk around. And they were like, oh, this is actually pretty nice in here. And I was like, yeah, whenever it's nice out. Yeah. It's Don't actually, come in January. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what I said. But um, no, it's always amazing uh, whenever 
they are able to travel here and just even if it's like two three days just having them around is such a it just gives me so much energy you know it's uh, it's amazing and then how about i mean can they easily stream everything now i mean that's oh yeah be nice. it's much I mean, that's, easier I, now. I, everybody that we've talked to you know with the mls games with apple when mm -hmm. we do these different broadcasts or everybody talks about when they're international is just the ease of finding and it's the same for you guys with the twos that's got to be fantastic no they love it you know the 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 bad thing is that almost every game is at like two three four <laughs> four a.m hey, you gotta but sacrifice a little sleep <laughs> they stay awake and they still you, stay they can awake sleep later in their lives right exactly. then not not yeah. while you're playing they gotta stay up for that I, yeah I, yeah i mean they would stay up for a world cup game if it was in the middle exactly. of the night you gotta stay up for your m and uc2 game exactly. even if it yeah. falls at two yeah. o'clock in the morning <laughs> yeah Oh, well, that's awesome. I so appreciate you taking the time. I mean, I'm sure we'll talk to you again. I love following the twos. I was just talking to another soccer dad, my daughter, um, her team, but she has a brother and they were like, oh, we got to, we got to find some more games to watch. She wants to watch mm -hmm. other outside backs. She wants to, you know, and everybody gets caught up in, in the, the highest level or the pros or whatever. Right. I said, no, you got to go to a twos game. You have to like, this they should is come the Wednesday. Next, this is what they <laughs> need to be watching, you know, like, and I just think, that's got to be the that's got to be the goal is this high level of quality soccer that everybody can see locally and grasp onto, especially when they're 12, 13, 14. Mm -hmm. And if you're thinking academy and if you're thinking like this is where this is where it's at. So they got, I got to get them up to NSC. And I know you guys got a couple game home games coming up here, so we'll have to get them yep. up there. You should. You should. Yes. Well, thank you. I appreciate thank taking so the much, time. Kendra. Enjoy the rest of your whatever day it is today. Is it Monday? Uh, I think it's Monday. <laughs> it's no, Monday. is it Tuesday? Monday. What day is it? It's, it's Monday. Monday. Okay, okay. okay, okay, cool. <laughs> it's Monday. <laughs> All right, have a great Thank day. You so Diego, much, I appreciate you it. Too. Thank hey, you. everybody, stay tuned. Next episode of uh, Sound of the Loons coming up next week after another busy week for Minnesota United.